All right, well, I didn't give you my uh, outline last time, and I should have, actually, because it's changed just a little bit since uh, what was printed on the web. Um, I already did the fundamentals of planetary climates. Today I'm going to talk about climate feedbacks in the carbonate silicate cycle. And then I'll go on. There's just one lecture on the faint young sun problem. I thought two was overkill on this. Uh, and I'll do the rise of oxygen and ozone. Then there's two lectures on hydrogen escape. Now I'm actually going to try to beat on that at this meeting because nobody understands it outside of atmospheric science. And it's the key to understanding whether oxygen and ozone are biosignatures on extrasolar planets. Um, so I'll spend quite a bit of time on that. And then I've taken my, I had one lecture listed on climate stability and I started putting it together and realized I couldn't possibly get through that in one lecture. So there's now two lectures on that. The first one is on Venus and the runaway greenhouse and the second one is on early Mars and then the boundaries of the habitable zone. And then finally I'll finish up, the last one is the same as advertised, it's is the Earth rare and that's the what I haven't said uh, already by this time about uh, my response to Warden Brownlee's Rare Earth book, which is kind of fun stuff to discuss. So let me get started on the uh, climate feedbacks talk here. And there's, I'm going to introduce some climate notation, just systems feedback notation that we use. Uh, it's pretty simple stuff, but it's really useful for understanding climate feedbacks. And this talk, I'm also going to talk about the carbon cycle and something called the carbonate silicate cycle, which most astronomers don't know about, but which is the real key to understanding why the Earth is habitable and how wide the habitable zone is. And then I'm going to talk about the importance of plate tectonics, which is actually a rare earth factor in Ward and Brownlee, but it fits in with the carbonate silicate cycle. Before I start, uh, Elaine Leger came up to me after my morning lecture, and uh, he said, I, I may have left people with the impression that the only thing we have to worry about with global warming is a temperature increase of 2 to 5 degrees Celsius. That's not what I meant to say. Two to five degrees Celsius is the equilibrium temperature response for CO2 doubling. And if we burn all our fossil fuels, CO2 could do much more than double. There's eight to 10 times the uh, atmospheric inventory of CO2 is in the fossil fuel reservoir, the recoverable fossil fuel reservoir. Most of that is in coal. So if you uh, burn all the fossil fuels, uh, Jim Walker and I did this in a model uh, about 20 years ago now. Um, then CO2 doesn't just double up to 600 ppm's, it goes up above 2,000 ppm's in our model. Dave Archer at University of Chicago has done a better calculation since then, uh, and he's, he's a member of the IPCC. He, he has a book on it called The Long Thaw. And notice that CO2 goes up. It could do this within a couple hundred years if we stay on our current trajectory on burning up fossil fuels. By the year 5,000, 3,000 years from now, you're still up around eight or 900 ppm's. And then we actually, Jim Walker and I ran our model out till you get back to steady state. That takes over a million years. And uh, that's something that a lot of people don't understand. But that is actually the time scale of the carbonate silicate cycle that I'm going to talk about today. It takes that long. You actually have to weather rocks on the continents before all that fossil fuel CO2 goes away. So when you think about it this way, you know, it's not just two to five degrees of Celsius of warming. That's enough to, you know, you get, I meant to fail to mention it here, but uh, if you say you go up by a factor of eight, that's three CO2 doublings, and you get two to five degrees Celsius for each one. So the total temperature increase could be six to 15 degrees Celsius. It lasts for thousands of years, in fact, for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years before you get back to normal. And so, you know, if we did that, I think we would definitely melt off the polar ice caps. Sea level would go up by 70 or 80 meters, and, uh, you know, it would be a very different Earth. You flood 20% of the continents which includes where 50% of the Earth's population currently lives. So in the long run, it is something that we want to pay attention to. All right, but it's 
not what this course is about, so we'll get back to uh, this course. Uh, we want to talk about feedbacks today. You know, the, the first talk I talked about radiative forcing, the, the absorption by CO2 and uh, water vapor, and just mentioned clouds. The, the, the thing that makes cli climate interesting and very uh, difficult is that the system is extremely nonlinear. There's all these feedback processes that come in. And I think I went through these numbers earlier uh, this morning. If you just double CO2, that's sort of the canonical climate change experiment for the modern Earth, you would only get 1.2 Kelvin just from the CO2 and water vapor, but if you or just the gaseous absorption. But uh, the actual climate model uh, 3D GCM calculations give you roughly 2 to 5 degrees Celsius. That's from the IPCC. They don't just run one climate model. They have 25 or 30 groups run climate models. And then those are that, that's the ensemble of uh, calculations. And that, so the, there's an amplification there. Uh, so there's net positive feedback. Half of that comes from water vapor, uh, as I'll mention in a moment. But then the rest of it comes from clouds. And, and the models disagree on how, what the cloud feedback is. And that's why th there's this uncertainty in what the climate would, will do. All right, well, here's the notation that I said I would introduce. This, this actually comes from the electrical engineering literature. I was introduced to it by my colleague Lee Kump at Penn State a while back. So you know, electrical engineers put together systems, and they have feedback such as the feedback that I would get if I get too close to the speaker with these microphones on, then you get a positive feedback loop that you're all familiar with. The way that the uh, engineers like to do this is they'll have a box that represents a component of a system. Uh, an arrow with a normal arrow he head on it is a positive coupling, meaning an increase in box A will cause an increase in box B. And an arrow, we like to draw it this way, with a, with a circular arrowhead is a negative coupling, so an increase in box A causes a decrease in box B. All right, well, what's uh, probably the most ob one of the most obvious feedbacks in the climate system? This is a positive feedback loop. It's the water vapor feedback. And this one is very intuitive as the climate warms. You know, the saturation vapor pressure of water is it's described by the clausius clapeyron equation, so it's an exponentially increasing function of temperature. Therefore, as you increase surface temperature, you tend to increase atmospheric water vapor. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, so that increases the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect increases surface temperature. If you go all the way around that loop, that's a positive feedback because it's all positive couplings. And one way to th think about this is if you have some perturbation to, uh, say, surface temperature, if surface temperature goes up, then atmospheric water vapor goes up, the greenhouse effect goes up, and when you get around the loop, surface temperature goes up even more. Right? It's fairly obvious. The, what this one does, if you just put, this is one you can put into a, a one-dimensional radiative convective climate model. You don't have to have a GCM. And in, a G, in, a, in an RCM, as we call them, that will double the, uh, the effect of CO2 doubling from 1.2K to 2.4K. So there's, you know, there's a, that's a well-known positive feedback in the climate system. And that's, that's destabilizing. Any positive feedback loops in systems tend to destabilize them. Uh, this one is, you know, it's not extremely destabilizing. The climate system, as I'll mention in a moment, has negative feedback loops in it too. So this doesn't destabilize the climate system. But if you move the planet much closer to the sun, it can destabilize the climate system. And so this is what we call the runaway greenhouse effect. And it's basically what we think happened on Venus. This is an old diagram, what I call the classical runaway greenhouse effect. And this, it's from some calculations that were published in 1969 by Rasool and de Berg. But the, uh, uh, there's a better figure in the, a little book by Richard Goody and Jim Walker that came out three years later. And so I like to use their figure here. Uh, this shows the assumptions that went into this calculation. What they did is they took Venus, Earth, and Mars, uh, formed them 
just magically at their present distances from the sun. They didn't worry about changes in solar luminosity. Um, this looks like an inverted phase diagram, basically. It's got the vapor pressure of water in good old CGS units here on the uh, horizontal axis. So that's 10 to the 6th in CGS is one bar. That's the Earth's surface pressure today. Uh, the vertical axis has surface temperature in kelvins. The solid curve is the saturation vapor pressure curve of water that comes from the clausius clapeyron equation. And of course, this is the boundary between liquid water and ice. So it's, it's a phase diagram, basically, with vapor, liquid water, and ice. Now, uh, then they started out these airless planets. And in Rasool and de Berg's calculation, they outgassed a mixture of CO2 and water. Uh, Goody and Walker did, just did pure water. They treated the water uh, with, with a gray atmosphere model. They didn't worry about the uh, variation in the absorption coefficient that I showed you in the, this morning's lecture. So you can do that if you pick a, a gray coefficient that corresponds to the window region of water vapor. Uh, let's look at Mars first. Mars starts, starts out airless. As you increase the uh, outgassing, it starts to build up a water, pure water vapor atmosphere. But by the time it gets uh, to about 10, a little over 10 dynes per centimeter squared, it, it intersects the saturation vapor pressure curve, and the rest of the water freezes out as ice. And they were quite happy with that, because if you look at Mars today, most of the water is ice that we can see. And so that's a pretty good approximation to present Mars. For Earth, as you outgas water, uh, you go, Earth is closer to the sun, so it starts out with a higher effective radiating temperature even without an atmosphere. It starts to get a little bit of greenhouse effect before it hits saturation, and that curves it up just enough that it inter intersects the saturation vapor pressure curve at the liquid water boundary, and so the rest of the water vapor that gets out gas comes out as oceans. And again, they're pretty happy with that because that's what we see where most of Earth's water is. It's in the oceans. Then Venus, you start outgassing that water, and before you ever hit saturation, the greenhouse effect takes off, so the temperature goes sky high. The rest of the water vapor stays in the atmosphere as steam, and that gives you this, uh, that's what we call a runaway greenhouse atmosphere. And then as I'll, I'll uh, lecture, you know, I think lecture seven or eight is on the runaway greenhouse. There's actually other ways to think about that. But once you get all that water vapor in the atmosphere, you can photo dissociate it with solar ultraviolet light. The hydrogen escapes to space, and basically the water is lost. So that's, that's just try to, you know, to illustrate the power of that positive feedback in water vapor. And that's why I'm going to belabor this point about feedbacks, because you get feedbacks that determine the inner edge of the habitable zone and feedbacks that determine the outer edge. And so if you don't think about feedbacks, you don't really understand why the Earth is stable and why Venus, for example, is not. All right, well, there's another well-known positive feedback in the climate system. And you probably already knew this one, too. Uh, this one is maybe even more obvious than the water vapor one. This is the snow and ice albedo feedback loop. It's a little bit more complicated because you've got some negative couplings in here. But you know the Earth has polar caps on it, and those polar caps are very reflective. The albedo of fresh snow and ice is something like 0.65, and the Earth's albedo as a whole is 0.3. The surface albedo is really only about 0.1. So when you put snow and ice on the surface, it reflects sunlight, and that makes it colder. So if we do that with a, what we call a systems diagram here, uh, an increase in surface temperature causes a decrease in snow and ice cover because you cause the polar caps to, to uh, retreat. You, can, you analyze each of these two couplings separately. So, so uh, an increase in snow and ice would cause an increase in planetary albedo, and an increase in planetary albedo would cause a decrease in surface temperature because uh, you're reflecting more sunlight back to space. Now, in this type of notation, two negatives make a positive. It's just like Boolean algebra. And so, uh, so the, the feedback loop here is also positive. And that's also easy to see by doing a perturbation because if you start out 
an increased surface temperature, then when you get to snow and ice cover, that turns into a decrease. That, that stays a decrease in planetary albedo, but then this last negative coupling here flips the sign again. So again, once you've gone all the way around the loop, the initial positive feedback ampl is amplified, and you get a positive feedback loop. So this one is not as important as the water vapor feedback loop today, and that's because the polar ice caps are relatively small, and also there's not that much sunlight that falls at the high latitudes. So this one doesn't have as big of an effect as the water vapor one. If you go back into the last ice ages, though, the Pleistocene glacial interglacial cycles that we're still in, really, we're in an interglacial within the glacial interglacial cycles, you get back towards glacial maximum and this ice albedo feedback loop becomes much more, much stronger. In fact, that's why the, the glaciations are as strong as they are. They're driven by so-called Milankovitch cycles, the variations in the Earth's orbit, but they're amplified by this ice albedo feedback loop. Um, these ones also, this cycle also can get out of control. And that uh, can lead to events that, that are called snowball earth uh, glaciations, which are controversial in geology. Not all geologists believe this, but a lot of us do. Uh, I believe in some form of snowball earth. Uh, th there are three times in the Earth's history, which I'll talk about not so much in this lecture, but I'll point them out in the next lecture. Back about 2.4 billion years ago, 0.7 and 0.6 billion years ago. I'm going to introduce the term GA, giga annum, which is how geologists write billions of years ago. You have to get used to that to read the uh, geologic literature. MA is mega annum, so that's millions of years ago, and KA is kilo annum, so that's uh, thousands of years ago. The idea with Snowball Earth is that if you get the ice sheets down past some critical latitude, then this positive feedback from the ice sheets uh, actually can uh, become unstable. And the, the critical latitude is somewhere near 30 degrees. You can illustrate that also with a simple climate model calculation. So this is, this is from what's called an EBM, an energy balance model. And I didn't talk about those this morning, but this is sort of an intermediate type of climate model where you parameterize the outgoing, the incoming solar and the outgoing infrared radiation, and you calculate the ice line as a function of uh, latitude. And, and then you, you, you have parameterized heat transport. So instead of doing meteorology, which is complicated, you do diffusion, which uh, physicists like, and it's easy to solve. And so you just uh, you fit the model to give observed seasonal cycles and, and uh, the, uh, well, the right seasonal response. So, so this was first done. These models have been done for 40 or 50 years. They were pioneered by Budiko in the uh, Soviet Union and by Sellers over in England, I think. I didn't know Sellers. So they're called Budiko Sellers models. I had a postdoc uh, several years ago, almost 20 years ago, Ken Caldera, who uh, did a model like this. And so it's a, it's a takeoff on Budico and Sellers. So what, what you've got here in Ken's figure is that this is effective solar flux here, which is the solar flux normalized to the value at Earth today. And this is sign of the ice line latitude on the vertical axis. The solid curves are stable solutions to the e EBM. And notice, and this dashed red line here, that's at, at a solar flux of one, that's, that's where the modern Earth is today. Notice that there's actually four, four solutions to this simplified, even this simple climate model, going to illustrate the nonlinearity. There is an ice-free solution, there's what's called the small ice cap solution, and that's the one that we're in today, because we have small ice caps. There's an, an unstable solution. I forgot to mention these dashed curves are unstable solutions to the equations. These, these, this can all be done analytically. You don't really need a computer model to do this. Uh, so that's an unstable solution with the ice line down in the tropics. Uh, and uh, then there's another stable solution with the ice line at the equator. That's snowball earth. And when, you know, once you get that ice line down there, then uh, it's hard to get away from it. Now, if you get stuck in Snowball Earth, uh, people didn't used to think that this could happen because uh, if you got there, you couldn't get out. Uh, but there are two ways out, and one 
is to sit there and wait until the sun gets about 27% brighter. Now, I haven't talked about the faint young sun problem. But we know that the sun is getting brighter with time by about 1% every 100 million years. So in something like two and a half or three billion years, it'll be 27% brighter. And then you would be up at this point, and that's where the unstable solution ends. So you would spontaneously transition up to the ice-free solution. Uh, so that, but that takes a long time to get there. Um, the other way to do it, uh, and this is what I'll talk about today, is by building up CO2 from volcanoes. Uh, so these three curves here, this one right here is for present day CO2 levels. 300 ppms is three times 10 to the minus four bars. Now if you, if you have 0.02 bars of CO2, you're on this curve over here. And at 0.12 bars of CO2, no, notice that the unstable branch uh, runs into the, the snowball earth solution at the present solar luminosity. So by the time, if you, as I'll discuss today, when, once you freeze over the earth, you can't get rid of volcanic CO2. So it just accumulates in the atmosphere. And so it takes a few million years, maybe five or 10 million years to build up a tenth of a bar of CO2, and then you spontaneously transition out of snowball earth. And the actual earth may well have done that. I'll show you a picture in a moment that, that supports that view. Hmm. From the ice-free, you're also stuck if you're once ice-free, or do you transition back from that? Um, well, the ice-free solution is stable. So unless something brings CO2 down, uh, I mean, what, what will happen is, is you would have a tenth of a bar of CO2, you're ice-free. The albedo, the surface albedo is now low because you freeze all the ice. So the surface temperature jumps up in that model to 50 or 60 degrees Celsius. It gets really hot. And then you have a really rapid episode of silicate weathering, which I haven't discussed yet, but which is in my lecture today. And that draws down all the CO2 that you put in. So there is a way out of it. it just, you just have to weather the continents to get rid of it. All right, so this is getting ahead of ourselves, but it's to illustrate, again, the, the power of these feedbacks, right? Now, both of those feedbacks are positive feedbacks. They, they both destabilize the climate. And if we only had positive feedback loops in the climate system, we'd be dead or we wouldn't be born uh, because the climate system would not uh, be stable. So there have to be positive feedbacks. And here's the, the biggest, most important positive feedback. And it's so obvious that nobody bothers to think about it. So then this one, uh, as you raise the surface temperature, you raise the outgoing infrared flux from the Earth. And of course, that's what cools the Earth, because the sunlight's coming in, and the Earth is radiating out in the IR. So that uh, you raise the surface temperature, that raises the outgoing IR. When you raise the outgoing IR, that cools the Earth. So that cools surface temperature. Like I said, it's, it's, so, it's almost stupid. It's so simple. But uh, that's what keeps our climate you know, stable on a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month basis, or even year-to-year. -year. However, this one can also fail. Uh, and that's why I put it up there. Uh, so this is another way of looking at the runaway greenhouse. And again, it's getting ahead of ourselves. But this is a figure from a paper that I did uh, 20 years ago when I was working on the runaway greenhouse. It was really Jim Pollack out at NASA Ames who got me interested in runaway greenhouses because he and Carl Sagan did the first calculations on them. You may know Carl Sagan is credited with doing the first non-gray calculations on the runaway greenhouse atmosphere. But that's a Pollack and Sagan uh, paper. Jim, Jim did all of the calculations, and Carl, of course, went around and publicized it. Uh, so, so Jim was quite good at radiative transfer. So in this one, uh, as I'll talk about later in the week, you, you just take the fully formed Earth with, with an ocean and you know, its present atmosphere, and you just push it towards the sun and see what happens in your computer model. And so uh, that's parametrized in, in terms of surface temperature here. And then, so surface temperature is just being arbitrarily raised in this model, and then the fluxes are calculated. FIR is the outgoing infrared flux, and FS is the effective solar flux that's being absorbed. And for now, I just want to focus on the outgoing infrared flux. Notice that when the Earth's surface is cold, as you make it hotter, the outgoing infrared flux increases, just as you would expect that it would. 
because it's basically Stefan Boltzmann law, the flux is sigma t to the fourth if you don't have an atmosphere. But the Earth has this ocean on it, and as the ocean goes into the atmosphere and gives you a steam atmosphere, then you have absorption by the water vapor. And at some point uh, around right here, where that curve bends over, the atmosphere becomes optically thick at all infrared wavelengths. And now it doesn't matter how much you raise the surface temperature, all the radiation is coming from the upper part of that steam atmosphere. And it's actually totally insensitive to surface temperature until you get up to about 1600 Kelvin. And at that point, uh, you're starting to radiate in the visible a little bit, and you can radiate right through the water vapor because it doesn't absorb so well at those wavelengths. Right, so this is another way of thinking about the runaway greenhouse. It's not just that positive feedback from the water vapor, but it's the breakdown of this negative feedback that we take for granted all the time. Okay, well let's, let's think then about what is it that keeps the Earth's climate stable on long time scales. So you actually, uh, that, that feedback is good, but it doesn't save you from things like snowball earth necessarily. There's a problem called the faint young sun problem, which is near and dear to my heart, which is the subject of the next lecture. And we know that the sun was less bright back, or we think that the sun was less bright back early in the earth's history, and it's been getting brighter with time. And you actually need something to stabilize surface temperature against these rather large changes in solar luminosity. So what is it that does that? Well, we think it's the carbon cycle that does that, uh, which affects the atmospheric CO2 level. And so most of the rest of this talk is focused on the carbon cycle. And I want to start out by, when I say carbon cycle, everybody already thinks they know what it is. And, but what they already know is what we call the organic carbon cycle. Uh, and here's a picture of it. So this is the one that that everybody basically is familiar with because it affects our day-to-day -day lives. You've got plants and algae in the oceans that are doing photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis, which chemically, to a geochemist, not to a biologist, to a geochemist is just CO2 plus water goes to CH2O, that's shorthand for organic matter, and the biologists always flinch when you write it that way, because organic matter is really more comp they, do, they do it too. They do it too, okay. Well, so it's a, to a geochemist, CH2O is organic matter, and you get oxygen from that, and that's reversed by respiration and decay. And as I mentioned, respiration is done by both plants and animals. It's not just us that breathe. It's basically all eukaryotes uh, that re uh, respire. That's how they get their metabolic energy. You know, there's a common misconception that plants get their metabolic energy from the sun, from photosynthesis, but that's not right. They're using that sunlight to make organic carbon, and they get their metabolic energy from respiration, right? Decay is just the, uh, it's really the same chemical process, but when organic, when a plant dies or uh, and then falls to the floor of the forest, it's acted on by aerobic bacteria that, that do the same thing after that organic matter, uh, the, the organism is dead. Okay, well that, that cycle is very interesting. It's very important for oxygen, obviously. But it's not, we think, what controls the atmospheric CO2 level on long time scales. And why is that? Uh, the rates of these cycles actually in the long term are just about the same. But uh, the way I like to think about it is that organic carbon cycle controls the oxygen content of the atmosphere. Where, and so it's not free to simultaneously regulate the CO2 content. And the, the inorganic carbon cycle, which is what I'm going to talk about next, uh, is then the, the part of the carbon cycle that is free to regulate atmospheric CO2. So this is an interaction between the atmosphere and rocks on the surface of the Earth, and so it's often called the carbonate silicate cycle. Well, here's a picture of this, and I'm going to go through this uh, in some detail because it's really the key to the rest of what I'll talk about for, for a good part of the week. Uh, we'll start over here on the left side of the diagram. Uh, there's CO2 in the atmosphere, and that uh, dissolves in rainwater and gives you carbonic acid which is a weak acid. Uh, it's the acid in soda pop, so it's not very strong. We all drink it all the time. But it's strong enough on long time scales to dissolve silicate rocks on the continents. 
And it's a little more complicated than this diagram because there's also carbonate rocks on the continents, but we don't care about that. And so I've written, it's the silicates that we care about, and I've represented them here by this, this mineral calcium silicate, CaSiO3. That's technically the mineral wollastonite, which is a very rare silicate mineral. Real silicates on the surface of the earth have these long complex chemical formulas, but they behave uh, to first order the same as wollastonite does here. So calcium silicate plus two CO2s plus a water, one of those CO2s plus a water gives you carbonic acid, gives through a process that we call weathering. Weathering is the interaction of atmospheric gases with surface rocks. And it, it takes liquid water to make that happen. So that's really the key to this whole thing. So when you have liquid water around, the CO2 dissolves in it, it weathers the continents, you get calcium ions, this is bicarbonate ion and dissolved silica. And those products of weathering get collected in groundwater and then they flow through streams and rivers to the oceans, where in the oceans, there are, in the surface ocean, there are various organisms that John may describe that live there, and some of them make uh, shells out of calcium carbonate. Uh, so you know, these pretty little foraminifera uh, and you know, basically most of the limestone that we see today. Uh, so these organisms make their shells. When they die, they fall down into the deep ocean. Most of the carbonate redissolves in the deep ocean because the deep ocean is slightly more acidic than the surface ocean. And that's actually because of the organic carbon cycle because there's also organic carbon falling into the deep ocean and that's taking CO2 out of the surface ocean and putting it in the deep ocean. And so it's essentially creating carbonic acid in the deep ocean. So, so again, that's not on the slide, but some of this carbonate survives. It gets down to the seafloor here and it collects in the ocean as carbonate sediments on the seafloor. Now the, the geochemists the, uh, go out and they, they go and they drill through those sea cores and try to collect them and then they look at the oxygen isotopes in that and that's how they actually know about the comings and goings of the ice during the uh, Pleistocene ice ages. But here we care about the carbon and you know, here's where plate tectonics comes into it. The seafloor isn't just sitting there, it's spreading away from the mid-ocean ridges and at certain plate margins, uh, the uh, oceanic plates are subducted, those carbonate sediments are taken, carried down, and of course the earth heats up as you go down, so you get to higher pressures and higher temperatures. And then uh, we have a process that's termed carbonate metamorphism, whereby calcium carbonate recombines with SiO2, which by this time is the mineral quartz, and that reforms calcium and actually magnesium silicates are part of this as well, so you get calcium and magnesium silicates and you get CO2 back out of that process. And then that CO2 comes back to, into the atmosphere through volcanoes uh, in uh, just above subduction zones. So the, the coast of Washington is a perfect example. So it's the Juan de Fuca plate that is subducting there and then you've got this range of volcanoes, the Cascades, that everybody out in Seattle uh, is very well aware of. That's exactly this process. So uh, this, this cycle is slow. Uh, you know, the, I didn't give you the time scales on the organic carbon cycle, but they're fast. Every CO2 molecule in the atmosphere, on average, it cycles through the organic carbon cycle about once every 10 years. This cycle is so slow that you don't just consider the atmosphere, you consider the atmosphere ocean system. So the atmosphere is exchanging CO2 with the ocean. And if you just take that combined system, all of the CO2 in that combined system is recycled about every half a million years. Uh, and so that's too slow to save us from global warming, although in that slide that I showed you, that, that's what has to happen before you get rid of the last of the fossil fuel pulse. But it takes a million years to do that. However, you know, on the solar evolution time scale, this is actually pretty fast because the sun is getting bright over billions of years. It's getting 1% brighter every 100 million years. So you know, it, with respect to solar evolution, this cycle stays more or less in steady state. And so this is, uh, so let's think about the feedback and then I'll put the diagram up. But you can do this one in your head. Suppose it gets really cold so suppose you went into snowball earth, which uh, we may well have done. You freeze over the oceans, 
you shut off evaporation, you may have a little bit of sublimation from the ice and snow, and you may get a little bit of snowfall at high latitudes, but you can't, the weathering reactions can't take place because the weathering requires liquid water for several reasons, but you know, think of it, you have to get that CO2 uh, carbonic acid in contact with grain surfaces and water infiltrates the soil and also removes the products of weathering from grain, so there's all sorts of reasons that you need uh, liquid water around to do it. And so if you go into snowball earth, you shut off the weathering, volcanism continues uh, though, and it doesn't look like it from this diagram because it looks like the whole cycle would grind to a halt, but that's misleading because the mean lifetime of seafloor is about 60 million years. You've got lots of carbonates there to go down. You've also got other types of volcanism that are not shown here. There's point volcanism like you have in Hawaii where you've got a mantle hot spot and coming up through the middle of the Pacific plate. There's actually CO2 coming out, a lot of volcanism at the mid-ocean ridges. In fact, that's where most of the volcanism is. So there's other sources of CO2. And so the argument is that uh, if, you get, if the Earth gets too cold, especially if it freezes, you build up this CO2 and then you get out of snowball Earth by the mechanism that I showed you on the previous slide. All right, we could do that with a feedback diagram if you like. It's a little bit more complicated, but not much more so. We start here with surface temperature on the left. If you increase surface temperature, you increase evaporation, and therefore you must increase rainfall. Uh, the increase in rainfall causes an increase in the silicate weathering rate. Also, the direct increase in surface temperature causes an increase in silicate weathering. That's just simple chemistry. Chemical reactions tend to go faster uh, when you raise the temperature. If you ever took a chem lab back in college or high school, you know, roughly every 10 degrees Celsius of warming doubles the, reaction, the rate of most chemical reactions at room temperature. So those couplings are all positive there. Silicate weathering is the long-term loss process for CO2 in this cycle. So an increase in silicate weathering causes a decrease in atmospheric CO2. Atmospheric CO2 is a greenhouse gas which increases surface temperature. So when you go around this loop, there's one negative feedback right here. And so that flips the side of, uh, sign of your perturbation, right? You start out with a positive one, and by the time you go around the loop, that perturbation is now negative and so it damps out with time as, as the system uh, progresses. All right, so uh, do we have any evidence that this works? Well, let's go back to Snowball Earth. In fact, this is, uh, this is what uh, actually didn't clinch the theory of Snowball Earth, but this is what gave it a lot of credibility. Paul Hoffman, who's now retired from Harvard, uh, went out to Namibia, which is sitting right on, you know, it's in equatorial Africa, and he was looking at uh, glaciations there. Namibia has been sitting uh, on the equator for a long time, including back to this Snowball Earth episode, which is around 600 million years ago. And you can't see it very well, but there's a, a glacial tillite right here. So evidence of glaciation. And then this 400 meter cliff above that is a big carbonate cliff. And, uh, Either that whole thing or sometimes just the bottom part of that uh, is called a cap carbonate. So it's carbonates, rocks, sitting right on top of a, a glaci uh, evidence for glaciation. And that is very unusual because you never see that in the Phanerozoic the last 500 million years and because the, the tillites, these glacial uh, deposits, form at high latitudes and carbonates form in warm waters. Uh, you know, you go carbonate, corals are carbonates, and coral reefs are all in the tropics. It's because calcium carbonate is less soluble in warm water, right? So, so you never expect to see carbonates and uh, tillites or other glacial evidence in the same locality, and here you do. And that was a big puzzle for, for several decades until the snowball earth theory came out. But, you know, in snowball earth, you predict this because when you shut, you freeze down the earth, then the CO2 builds up in the atmosphere. Uh, it gets really hot, you melt off that ice, and then you get a real rapid episode of silicate weathering, and you also weather carbonate rocks on the continents and redeposit that in, in, on the seafloor. And that, we think, is what causes these cap carbonates.
So, so the snowball earth theory was, was proposed uh, by Joe Kirschfink from Caltech back around 1990, but nobody paid much attention to it until about 1998 when Paul Hoffman and Dan Schrag and their colleagues uh, published this science paper where they pointed out these cap carbonates and, and made the connections. All right, so this brings me to the last part of my talk, which is uh, plate tectonics. John, you already said that you think plate tectonics is important, and I'm curious to see what you'll say. I think plate tectonics is important because it's part of this carbonate silicate cycle. And of course, uh, plate tectonics, you've probably seen a little bit of this. The Earth has all these plates. There's 20 or so plates uh, that move around on the surface of the Earth. There's a lot of subduction zones in this ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so this is, uh, I won't go through the whole theory of plate tectonics. But we think that the Earth's plates are moving around. Instead, I'll pose this as a question. This is a picture of Venus uh, taken. I mean, the question I should have posed earlier, the, the one that we're interested in as astronomers is, will other planets have plate tectonics, other rocky planets? And it's not an answered question. But uh, in, in rare, to preface this, in the book Rare Earth, Ward and Brownlee argue that plate tectonics is rare. And they say that uh, that's, their evidence for that is that there's 20 large rocky planets and large moons in the solar system. Uh, Earth is the only one that has plate tectonics, hence plate tectonics is rare. So let's, uh, let's think about that. Let's look at Venus here. This is an image. You can't see Venus in the visible, right, because of the clouds, but in the radar you can. And so this is an, uh, it's a surface roughness image taken with synthetic aperture radar. The Magellan spacecraft was going around Venus uh, 20 years ago or more. And so they're reflecting radar beams off the surface. And then the JPL artists have colored this in. The smooth surfaces are colored blue. And they're probably the low-lying areas. And the rougher surfaces are colored uh, brown here. They're probably mountains. But let's look at that and go, uh, do, can you tell from that diagram if Venus has plate tectonics? Does anybody have an opinion on that? It doesn't. Warden Brownlee said that it doesn't, right? So, and they're probably right. So let's let's compare that with Earth, and we'll look at two pictures of Earth. These are both uh, t uh, done with altimetry, so either radar or laser altimetry, where you're actually measuring altitudes. So here's sort of a fuzzy picture, but I like to show that because. It's got the Atlantic Ocean in the center, and you see that ridge going down the middle there. That's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which John will, you know, will probably talk about at length. You know, that's where the spreading uh, is pre, uh, happening in the Atlantic. That's what's separating out you know, North America from Europe over the last uh, 100 million years or so. So that's a mid-ocean mid ridge that's evidence for plate tectonics. Here's a higher resolution view of the other hemisphere. And you see things like uh, mountain chains here where the Himalayas are created, where India is crashing into Asia. And there's this, uh, is, this a, is that a bunch of seamounts there, John? It's not a spreading ridge, but a bunch of seamounts. So this is like the Hawaiian Islands where the plate is drifting over a hot spot. Uh, and there's a rift zone here. There's the Red Sea, which is rifting. Africa's moving away from Asia. Right, so a trained geophysicist uh, can look at this and tell you in an instant that there's plate tectonics going on on the Earth. Um, so there is good evidence for plate tectonics on Earth. And then if you look back at the Venus picture, you don't see that. You see some what are probably high areas and some low areas, but none of these same uh, plate tectonic features. And so why is that? Oh, one thing while we're looking at it, see this circle down there? That's, that's not a, an artifact, that's real. That's a big crater uh, on Venus, right? So there's, there's craters there. Doesn't get resurfaced very uh, often. So, so you know, why, the question is, why does Venus not have plate tectonics? And you know, Venus is almost as big as the Earth, not quite, but it probably has roughly the same amount of internal heat. What's different? Well, it lost its water. And so there was a very, uh, I thought, insightful uh, hypothesis. Actually, I've got one more 
One more piece of evidence that Venus doesn't have plate tectonics. This is a map of crater distributions on Venus. Uh, and there are no craters smaller than about three kilometers because the object's impactors don't get through the thick atmosphere. But larger than that, there are, and they're randomly distributed over the surface. So that tells you that the entire surface is roughly the same age, whereas on Earth, the continents are roughly a billion years old, and the seafloor is only 60 million years old. So there's this big dichotomy in surface ages also that tells us that Venus doesn't have plate tectonics. So, so we think, and this was a, a theory that was published by Don Turkett uh, a long time ago now, the entire surface of Venus looks like it's between a half a billion and a billion years old based on crater counting. And what Turkett uh, proposed is that uh, you know, plate tectonics on Earth gets the geothermal heat out on sort of a regular basis. And water, according to Turkett, is the key to that. Water is to plate tectonics as oil is to an engine. It lubricates the whole system. You know, the, uh, if you think about the theory more carefully, the, these lithospheric plates are floating around on the semi-molten asthenosphere at the top of the mantle. And the reason it's semi-molten is because that asthenosphere has water and that lowers the melting point of the rock. So the plates on Earth move around smoothly and get the geothermal heat out. On Venus, that doesn't happen. And so, you know, there's no movement and no movement and all this heat from radioactive decay builds up in the interior. And finally, it gets hot enough that you get a planet-wide uh, uh, volcanic uh, melting eruptions. And so you get volcanism that resurfaces the entire planet probably the most recent one being a half a billion to a billion years ago, and that lets out all that geothermal heat, and then the whole system freezes up again until the cycle repeats. And so it's a very different type of system, and arguably not that good for recycling CO2, and maybe not that good for other parts of biology. So that brings me to the end here, and so the points that I have tried to make are that feedbacks play an important role in the climate system, some of them, like water vapor and ice albedo, are destabilizing. The CO2 climate feedback from this carbonate silicate uh, cycle is stabilizing. And as we've just been discussing, plate tectonics is part of that. And so something like plate tectonics, or at least some mechanism for recycling CO2 on a regular basis, is probably necessary. So I'm done. Quick question. I know when we're talking about plate tectonics, Norm Sleep, for example, believes that Mars actually underwent plate tectonics sometime during its first four or five hundred million years. <coughs> and in discussion with others, but, uh, is it possible that, that Venus in its first four or five hundred years actually had plate tectonics? Well, it could. So, uh, you know, if you need water, then that would require Venus to hold on to water for four or five hundred, hundred million years. That's possible, although it may have lost its water quicker than that. And, of course, it's very, it's very difficult. We'll, we'll eventually know the answer for Mars because we'll get up there and uh, be able to, you know, get ge geologists looking around for evidence of it. On Venus, it's really difficult to test. Venus uh, is hard. Mars actually has some minerals on there that indicate a that water rock reaction that, that might have come from some early kind of plate tectonics. So, you know, there's a, there's a mineral called olivine, which I'll talk quite a bit about later on, but it's very, very reactive with water and does a lot of really cool things. And that's found in Mars. So I won't tell you any more about it. Uh, yes? Um, on your diagram from the nature paper, could you show the trajectory of one global glaciation cycle? Um, you know, the, from here to there. That diagram doesn't do it. Paul Hoffman has some figures in his papers. I, I should have put one in, I suppose, that shows a trajectory. And you know, it goes from uh, ice free, you lower CO2, you freeze up, and then you build up the CO2, and then you melt. And then, so you can draw that in phase space. And I, I didn't think to put a picture in. Yes. Uh, concerning the, the formation of CrCO3 in the ocean, is it at present time more a, a biological way through the animals we shell, or is it a mineral process? 
So t today, th that's a very good question because it brings up something I didn't mention. Uh, today, almost all the calcium carbonate is precipitated biologically. And there, there are some other books. There's another whole theory that I haven't mentioned, the Gaia hypothesis that by Jim Lovelick and uh, Lynn Margulis. And so they would argue that, that life itself is important in stabilizing climate. And life plays a role, for instance, in the carbonate silicate cycle by in several ways, but one of them is by precipitating out the calcium carbonate. It turns out that that probably doesn't, that's not critical because that's not the rate limiting step. The rate limiting step on CO2 removal is the silicate weathering. And another way of thinking about this is the, the surface ocean on average is supersaturated by a, a factor of between two and five in most places, supersaturated in calcium carbonate, but it's difficult, kinetically diff difficult to precipitate and organisms just simply take advantage of that and make their shells. So if you take the organisms out, you'll just build up higher degrees of supersaturation. And then John, I mean, the, the uh, calcareous algae have only been around for, is it 100 million years, or? Yeah, they go back to late Cretaceous. So, you know, at that time, you know, the, the, the algae was a very early So that has a huge effect on those cycles. Yeah. You did have massive greenhouse effects. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting, for example, to look for an extrasolar planet that's actually going through a Cretaceous period. It would be a, a really cool thing to see. Oh, I think so too. <laughs> at the time of the snowball Earths, uh, there was no uh, animals. So at this time, this was essentially a mineral fixation of carbonate. Well, it is and it isn't because, as John will attest, you know, there, there were other organisms living on Earth that, that didn't make shells out of calcium carbonate, but there were mat, uh, microbial mats, stromatolites, and they're doing photosynthesis and they're actually pulling CO2 out of the uh, water and that, that decreases the acidity and, and causes uh, calcium carbonate to precipitate. So actually, calcium carbonate precipitation has been biologically mediated for probably three or four billion years. And, um, but that, you know, as I said, I, I don't think that part's critical. The, the part that, is, that uh, I won't discuss, but it's more controversial, is uh, organisms actually accelerate silicate weathering on the land, and they do this by pumping up the CO2 partial pressure in soils, and also creating other acids besides carbonic acid. You have all these humic acids that are stronger acids. And the, so there's sort of an, uh, uh, there's a biological enhancement of weathering, and we argue about how important that is. Yeah. Uh, Io has volcanoes, and so wouldn't you expect to have plate tectonics there? Uh, that's a good question. Io doesn't have plate tectonics, as far as we can see. It has about 20 times the, the uh, internal heat that, uh, that the Earth does. Now, I'm getting that number from a talk that Bill Moore gave at the uh, astrobiology meeting last year. And you know, so the question is, how does the heat get out on Io? On Io, it gets out through uh, volcanoes. So you know, Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And instead of having plates that slowly spread around, most of the heat is coming out through eruptions themselves. And, and so Bill Moore calls that heat pipe uh, tectonics. And it, it may indicate that if your heat flow is too high, you don't get plate tectonics. You get a different form of heat release. But you still have convection, don't you? Uh, that I don't, uh, I'm not the person to ask. The heat, the heat source is different because it's tidal heating, and so it's probably not coming from as deep, and I don't know whether you would have internal mantle convection in Io. Yes? If spectra was the only thing you could look at, could you infer the presence of heat? Uh, can you can you detect plate tectonics from spectra? Probably not. So you're going to have to in, you know look at other things. You can look at atmospheric gases through spectra, and then you're going to have to infer things about plate tectonics. We really need a theory of plate tectonics because hopefully we will be able to get masses for these planets that we can see. And so we'll, we'll know that it's a super Earth with two, two Earth masses, and you would like to have a theory that tells you whether that's going to have plate tectonics. So far, I don't think we have a very good one. Good question, though, because I think that 
Yes. Is this snow or earth phenomenon a phenomenon which occurs on a regular basis? Is there any fear about that? Because that would restart basically the evolution of higher life. Yeah, well, fortunately, they don't occur on a regular basis. There's, there's probably two episodes in the late Proterozoic around 600 and 700 million years ago, and then there's probably one at 2.4 billion years ago when oxygen goes up, which I'll talk about uh, tomorrow or the next day. Um, so, so, let's see, what was the other part of your question? The, the, I mean, this would restart the evolution oh. of higher life in the yeah, there's, there's other parts to Paul Hoffman's snowball earth hypothesis which are more controversial and which I believe in less. He would argue that the snowball earth episodes in the late Proterozoic triggered the Cambrian explosion. They triggered the rise of multicellularity. And you know, Paul will sort of wave his arms, as I'm doing at the moment, and say that by putting life through this real constriction, somehow that bred diversity and, you know, I'm not the right person to comment on that. John could probably comment on that. But it, there's a time scale problem because the last Snowball Earth episode was at 610 million years ago, and the Cambrian explosion, the best dates are 542 million years ago. So that's 70 million years. There's a per period prior to the Cambrian, the, the Ediacaran, where you've got multicellular, some kind of plants, animals, for about 20 million years but there's still a, a huge time gap. And so I, I don't really believe that part of uh, Snowball Earth. I don't know what you think, I'll, I'll make a comment. I, I think uh, the biologists, and uh, particularly the, a lot of the, the, the new biology, uh, at the time of the Cambrian explosion, we, we now know, in fact, it's, it's created a new field in biology called evo Devo, which is uh, short for evolution development, which is, uh, also comes from understanding embryonic stuff. But what Evo Devo says is that you develop a set of genes that in combination, in different combinations, start creating, uh, doing macroevolution. And so in the Eticarian, there's no evidence of these so-called genes, which are called Hox genes, genes that work together. No evidence of that in the Eticarian, but evidence of that in the Cambrian explosion. So the view is, among at least my biology colleagues, is that the development of those Hox genes, if you're interested, I can go more into it at some point. It, it, the Hox genes uh, are what really caused the Cambrian explosion. So for example, one set of those genes called the Pax genes are involved in all light receptor uh, uh, organs, including you know, our eyes and the little planaria's little heat, uh, or little uh, light organ. And then there's other genes that are involved in making appendages. And so the, the separation, going from the Eticarian to the Cambrian, we actually have this sort of bi bipolar type of, of, of design that we see in crustaceans, that we see in us. Uh, and that's a set of these ox genes. And those are, that's, that's, that's what I think the, the current view is. It has nothing to do with well, there's a, there's a slightly different current view among ge uh, geologists. And so, you know, we're ta we'll talk a little bit about the rise of oxygen. Uh, the, the first rise in oxygen is that we, we're pretty sure is at 2.4 billion years. But there's pretty good evidence now for a second rise in oxygen in the late Proterozoic, around seven or 800 million years ago. And so a lot of ge geologists, like Andy Knoll, for instance, would argue that it was the second rise in oxygen that triggered the Cambrian explosion because now you had enough oxygen not just for single-celled life but for multicellular You know, life. I agree that you know, there are those, you know, oxygen and probably other factors allow the selection of, of the Hox type genes to actually really radiate out and, and create the wonderful, wonderful diversity. That, how many of you have seen that, the diversity of animals and some of these, I mean, they're absolutely incredible. It's, it's psychedelic design by evolution I mean, compared to even what we have today. This is amazing. But so there's a lot of factors involved. I mean, you may want to comment too on Berner's idea of oxygen and the Cretaceous perhaps going up to 30%. Do you know that? Yeah, I mean, it could have been higher. So. Yeah.
So, Deborah, you, Deborah had one question that she was trying to get in. If we could just. Well, it, it does. I mean, you can actually weather the seafloor too. And so there's a question was what would happen on, on a water world, for instance. You don't have the continents. And, but I think it's too close to dinner to get very far into that. We, we'll discuss it over. So let's thank all speakers again.